Well, hello, hello, welcome back. I'm AJ O'Neill, this is Beyond Code Live, and we're doing a little bit of a just really, really basic fundamentals. Hello, hello, hello. Getting, welcome oops. back. I'm AJ That's me. Oh, oh, oh. Had my own thing going. Let me turn all this off. Okay. <laughs> doing really basic, just fundamentals of getting started programming with Casper's. And then, Casper's, I'm just going to start sharing my screen with you. Give me one second here. And then your... That's, I think that's coming from you, the echo there. Is that? I don't hear um, it anymore. I think I think it's good now. Okay. Um, I have muted also a live stream right now. Okay. Screens. There we go. All right, so you see my screen? Um, give me a second. Ba, 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 ba. Yes, I do. Let me just enlarge it. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I just got a little yeah, pad okay. here to take notes. So you were saying you want to know how do you start a programming project, period, and you're given the analogy of if you were doing a paper, you'd have a title and you'd have an intro and then you'd have some other stuff and you'd wrap it up with some sources that you cite. And so you want to know what's the anatomy of a program? What's, what's the hamburger look like? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't quite know how to answer it in the sense of what you were talking about, like a document. Uh, the way that a document is structured because that's structured around a, a written story and programming is really structured around actions that we want to help somebody be able to accomplish and so the way that I would suggest starting would be using specifically Figma I think it's the best tool out there and kind of well I guess I, I guess there is a step before we go to Figma like is what's the problem why aren't the existing solutions good enough and so you could look at this from a perspective of let's say a website a website isn't really programming heavy but it's a lot of markup language and stuff it's certainly technical what's the problem are you not able to reach people with uh, flyers are you not able to reach people via text? Uh, is cold calling not working? Do you need a better place to, you know, like what is the reason that you need a website? Or what is the reason that you need a program? You, you have to start with why. Do you actually have a problem and, and kind of understand what are the existing solutions and why aren't they good enough? Why is it worth writing? A program at all is that um, yeah um, let's say if I can give an example as as I would face um, the problem for example um, let's say you have PDQ machine where you tap your pass and the transaction goes through for whatever you have paid and um, how for example for um, this PDQ machine who takes all the transactions um, to, for example, say, you know, you don't have um, enough funds in your card and it displays a message as insufficient funds, for example. Okay. So what's, what's PDQ? Is that like a public transit type of... Um, I don't know what it stands for back in the days when I used to deal with um, with the money transactions. So it, it, it's, a, it's a simple, basically a card machine where you can either tap your pass or insert the pass and um, and it, it will deduct whatever amount is stated on a PDQ machine. Let's say when you go to hotels and you gotta pay by your card or um, any, any shop uh, in Walmart Oh, interesting. I'm not really familiar with that. So it's it's like a like a card that has money on it that you can use almost like a credit card, but you tap it. 
you know, eat. So when you go to any restaurant to any shop, yeah, you would normally have some. You're gonna have some means of paying it. So if you're paying by card, they will insert in, in the machine, and that machine is called PDQ machine. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So this is this is we we're talking about for credit cards, not for. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, just okay. So this is this is like the credit card. I think we call it point of sale here. Okay. We call yeah. that we call it POS point of sale. I don't know what PDQ stands for, but. But, uh, okay, yeah, all right. And so, I, I, so th at this point, the question is not really how do we create something new, but it's how do we look at something that exists and kind of break down how I might approach creating a program to deal with this, right? Yeah, for example, what kind of errors can we encounter, let's say, if the car doesn't have enough funds in it, um, then um, when the transaction goes through, then um, it will display, please re uh, please remove your card, so and so. Yeah. Okay. So that one involves hardware as well as software. So you're not you're not just programming a thing; you're interacting with lots of different pieces. So that one's we can talk about it hypothetically, but realistically. There's programs that run on different parts of that machine. That machine probably is connected to a computer. Uh, it probably reads in some in information. The, the ones, the old ones where you used to swipe, that one actually is recognized by the computer as a keyboard. So in the old machines where you swipe the credit card, it literally, you could connect that machine via USB and it would, it would be the same as typing out the number of the credit card. Um, with the one where you do the tap, there are two different ways that that's done. The secure way is public private key and the insecure and probably much more common way is a shared key. But basically it's, it, um, has some information that's in the card. The card gets just enough electricity to do a small calculation and then it gives back a result of the calculation, which then goes into the system to be it goes across the internet and then the receiving system looks at the pieces of information that were given to the card and the piece of information that the card gave back and then verifies that the transaction is authentic or not uh, when you're looking at insufficient funds you're talking about uh, it's going over the internet looking at uh, an account system or it actually could be going through the telephone I, a lot of these types of systems where they have legacy parts that have existed for 50 years, they don't upgrade everything at once. So part of the system might do the authorization process I was talking about. Another part of the system might actually still use the telephone and do touch tone dialing. And then as far as how you consider what the errors or state of the machine is, there's a concept called a state machine that you could use both to diagram that out as well as to, um, you could implement a state machine in code that verifies that you handle the errors correctly and you don't get stuck in a loop where the machine doesn't work. So that, that type of a real world hands-on physical system is complex because it has a lot of parts and so for that, I, I wouldn't be able to say, okay, here's how you start programming that because you're talking about five or six different things that you would be programming. So we'd have to take it down into, you know, a single bit of, we could treat it like a vending machine and say, how, do, how would we write a program that can handle deducting funds and detecting if the funds are insufficient and detect, detecting what kind of change should be given back, at, if any, that we could write as a program. But I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, as a beginner programmer, somebody wanting to learn to code, here's how we break down this point of sale system to a realistic scope because it's not, it's not something that anybody, any one person could realistically uh, write a program for because there's so many different parts. So uh, with that description in mind, 
do you have do you have something specific about the process you'd like to take a look at from th from that description? Um, not not in the near future. It will it will be in the future. However, it's not in, in the near future at the moment. Um, I don't know. Um, if you can give an example of maybe vending machine or something, wh wherever it's easier to break down. Let's say what kind of problems and solutions we can encounter um, by by creating a code. Um, okay. Do you have any examples? Well, let's let's go with let's go with this, but let's let's we have to imagine some things. Um, or, or let's go with the vending machine. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with the vending machine. The first thing that I would suggest is drawing stuff out. Once, once you have a rough description, like what we just did, I'd say go draw it out. Um, and then try to think about how things are connected to each other and how somebody's going to interact with it. So in this case, we're talking about a physical device, not a computer screen. And so... Uh, we, it's a little, it's actually a little bit more difficult for me to think about that just because I'm used to being able to say, okay, well, here's, here's a screen and, you know, here's, here's a screen. We're going to have a button on it. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have a title that says, you know, welcome. So with this case, if we're trying to emulate a physical object, I have to think a little bit more about it. Um, but, but let's say, let's say this is, let me just draw this out. Okay. This is a vending machine. The vending machine has a couple of different parts to it. There's, there's the window where we can see all the goodies inside, which let's just say it looks like this. So there's the glass with all the goodies inside. Um, there's a place where I'm going to uh, either tap or insert my card. So let me just put, here's, the, we'll call this the card slot. And then we'll make a little circle where I can tap it if I want to do the tappy-do. Um, there's going to be a place where I get my stuff out of it. And just whatever, just give this a color to be distinct. Um, there's going to be a keypad where I'm going to, and I guess the keypad would actually just be part of this. So let's just make this bigger and we'll make make this a little smaller there. I'll, I'll zoom in on this a bit. There we go. All right, so we're going to tap or insert there. We'll have a little keypad on here. And I'm just trying to think about this as a actual real world thing. So the components that I'm going to interact with are the motor that, that makes something drop. And there's, say, I'm just going to draw. This represents one of those spirals that the, the spiral will drop the item. So we'll just put these in here. So that, that's something that I would be in control of as a program. And I guess we could go with the, your, you know, the, your example system like this. If we just say one part of the program that's not the part of the program that we're going to write is the drop motor I, or whatever we want to call that. But we're not going to write this part of the program. It's, we're just going to say that it's a library that exists. Like when we program in a browser, there's a bunch of stuff that we don't have to write that we just get because it's there because the people at Google and Microsoft gave it to us and if we were to write this program I imagine that that would be there and then the person would key in 
um, there's a there's a keypad to key in what they want which means that inside of here it's got to know well there's a bunch of drop motors uh, motors that or twist motors I don't know what to call it yeah let's say four for example yeah there's four four options for you to choose from sneakers twix whatever yeah all right, then I got a keypad that's going to let me put in a string. You know, I get to put in, say, like, in this case, A3. Um, there's going to be a place where it takes in cash or card, which for this case, let's say that it's cash because that's simpler to reason about. And then there's going to be there's going to be a coin return. Let me uh, let me put this here. We're going to have our coin return It'll be that same color as the other one. And then I'm actually going to draw a rectangle over it halfway. And then let's just group that together. Okay, there we go. So that's that's representative of our of our coin return so we want to identify what the parts of the system are that a person's going to interact with they're going to put some cash in they're going to type on a keypad and then the other things that are doing something that we could control is we're going to select a motor and tell it to drop an item and then we're going to we're going to say to dispense change. And so again, this is kind of tough because I'm I'm used to thinking about it like a, a problem where we have a computer and we either are typing at the computer, or we have a web page and we're building a button that the user interacts with, like you know, count how many clicks happen or something like that. But in, yeah. but in this case, we're, we're kind of assuming that there's a lot of stuff that already exists. So this would be the cash, what did we, receiver? I don't know what we call that. And so I, we could take the smallest, we could take these one by one and and just kind of look up the documentation for them. But we, we've identified them at least. So let's say this. We want to write some pseudocode so I, that, that is basically a cross between English and code, as, as what we call pseudocode. And pseudocode is we, we write a description. So there's, there's going to be a, a, a function when a person starts a transaction what what's the first thing that would need that to happen is to put, put in that money in okay put the money in okay so so let's say we're gonna have a function that's receive money and this is gonna kick things off so we want an amount of cash that it's gonna receive and so the, the, then the next thing that we're going to need is the, that, that's going to give us a balance. So display dot update balance cash. So there's going to be there's going to be some object that's a display. If money goes in, we're going to update balance and then we're going to display dot um, ask selection does that sound right yeah so up updates and ask are the keywords yeah so yeah okay yeah so let, let's just shorten that down we'll say update cash and ask okay so then what's the next thing that has to happen um the next thing is let's say to choose the uh, product you want to get from vending machine. Okay, so function 
um, like keypad, no, not keypad, but uh, on key press, let's say. Okay, let me, let me, let me take this a little bit more. So we want to say, again, on, I'm just going to write this in English, on event cash inserted, receive money cash. On event uh, key pressed, um, this would be like store selection or something. Yeah. And, and we'd have to have something because there's going to be like an enter key. So basically until they press the enter key or there's an error, this event could happen multiple times. And so th this either of these events could be happening simultaneously because they could put in a dollar, they could press a key, they could put in another dollar, and we could do something to keep track of the state and... Um, um, let's, let's assume that you are throwing in exact amount of cash um, to purchase the product. Um, However, um, let's add if uh, if you key in digit three and the product is not available. So uh, I don't know, maybe to do something with if statements. Yeah. So what you want to determine here? So realistically, you'd have multiple key presses. But in, the, in our simple example, yeah, you could get away with just one key press because it could be one, two, three, or four. There could be just four buttons in our simple example. But realistically, you'd want to register the keys and actually build them together to figure out, okay, do they want D, they want D5, they want D7, they want A5. And then you'd also want to allow them to, which I guess on vending machines, typically it's a big grid. And so you can press, you do actually press according to the grid you and and then it just keeps it just subtracts money every time you press you like a7 enter uh, b2 enter and then it keeps track of the money it's subtracting right um, so certain in terms of like a f the format of the program I feel like this is kind of what you want to do is you want to define like what might this function what what might this function do and then i'm just making up some names of things here but this is fine for for pseudocode um so we, we could check storage we could do storage dot check key is item available and then we could say if or, or maybe storage dot has or maybe if storage doesn't have, I don't know, this this is actually getting a little bit too much into the, the technical details of the programming, um, as opposed to the, like the, the more broad strokes. But, um, yeah, if, if it has the item, then we might wanna say, you know, um, motor dot dispense or motor dot drop whatever item is at this key and then we're done otherwise we might want to display um, updates you know no more item is that So you, you could you could go through you could write out the program kind of like this and it doesn't need it doesn't need to be real code I mean I'm I'm making it look like real code but you can write it out in English you just need to get to a point of understanding what are your processes that you're trying to get to and and focus on one small one at a time um, yeah and, and then add the next one later on but I think a real key thing is 
that a lot of people think about programming as you know it's going to run line one and line two and line three and line four and so forth but in reality that's not the case because you know the program just sits there and it's waiting for somebody to insert cash and then when somebody inserts cash that's when the receive money function is going to kick off you know so it's, it's yeah. just going to sit there and do nothing until there's something to interact with and same thing you know the keypad we could have a, a state that we could define here. This is like super rudimentary, but state is say waiting. And then, you know, if money, we could say if waiting is equal to the state, or rather if, if waiting is not equal to the state, then display dot update say busy and then we could look at on key press um, let's see well and then we want to change the state say the state is ready here and we could say the state could also be ready here well if we if we press a key uh, if not ready, then we could say display dot update insert cash. I'm not ready. Sorry, AJ, for interrupting. Um, no, go ahead. Um, just wanted to ask you. Um, is I, I did cover some basics in Python um, and I was wondering whether you have if um, if else and if else statements at all um, in, in, ja in JavaScript or not okay so let's let's talk about this for a second this is this is a little bit better thing to talk about actually uh, than going through the state machine every programming language every because people talk about like, oh, I don't know how to do this in Python. I don't know if this language does this or that. Every programming language does the exact same thing. That's why it's a programming language. Because if if it was if it was if it didn't if it wasn't capable of accomplishing the exact same tasks, it wouldn't be a programming language. The whole purpose of programming language is that it can do any logical task. So every programming language has if else. Every programming language has functions. Every programming language has, has variables. Every programming language has uh, objects. Every programming language has numbers and strings. And there are some really, really, really niche programming languages that don't have these things. But we're talking about extremely experimental, uh, based on hypothetical math, uh, you're not going to run into these languages in your career. You're not going to run into languages that you actually need to use that don't have all the things. There is nothing unique about Python except that the, the, there's one unique thing about Python. And that's that it requires indentation. And that's what makes Python great. Um the words that it uses, some of the structures that it uses are different, but every programming language has a way to do a for, a while, um, some sort of loop, some sort of function. There are differences in how those things can be treated, like for example, in Python, Python variables are strict meaning that once you use something as a number in Python, you can only use it as, an, as a number. And this is really good. Uh, this is any, any good language should have strict typing. Unfortunately, there are some languages, <coughs> JavaScript, that have loose typing. Okay. Um, so, in the... I would say that every 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 programming language has what we'd call primitives, and that's objects and collections or lists 
arrays, um, I guess a set kind of sort of. So this is also known as a hash map or something like that. There's numbers, there's strings. There can be different types of numbers such as an integer and a, uh, a decimal point, floating point. Strings are, there can be either ASCII or UTF-8 slash Unicode. Um, and basically, Unicode is emojis. So if you can do Chinese and you can do emoji and you can do things other than the base Latin set, ASCII is a string that is the base Latin set. So A through Z, 0 through 9, enter key, backspace. Basically what you find on an American keyboard, the A in ASCII, I believe, is American Standard Character Interface, something like that. But it's, I think it's American Standard Characters. And then Unicode is international. So that's where you get your emojis and all that other stuff from. Um, and then usually you have some sort of null, which is often associated with objects. And functions are sometimes considered primitives. But these are basically the building blocks of data in a language are these things. Numbers, strings collections and objects. And Python calls that a dictionary. Mm -hmm. And I think Python and Python also has one called tuples, which is yeah. um, potato potato. Tuples are interesting. Uh, but they're essentially just they're essentially just an, a list. A tuple and a list aren't that much different, as you may have noticed. It's hard to describe the differences between them, except when looking at them in a particular programming language. Um, so, in the better a better way to put this might also be this, these are also called structs. Um, anyway, so how's that? Yeah, well, that has opened up another world a little bit um, in terms of that. There's quite a few things in common, um, let's say, in between the languages, um, uh, but which, which, for example, programming language um, is better than the other because there should be probably a difference between um, JavaScript and um, Python itself, isn't it? Yeah, so why pick a language? There's basically two reasons that I can think of. One is you have to and the other is well, I guess there's three reasons. Why, why different languages? Uh, because somebody said so. Uh, you have to use JavaScript in a browser. And I'm going to say pretty colors. And then uh, made to work with the internet and multi-core CPUs. So let's go over this. There's a lot of languages that you have to use just because they're the only language that's available for that platform because the people that started working on that did it a particular way and we're just stuck with it. So uh, for the longest time, if you were going to work on Windows, you basically just wrote things in C sharp and that was that. And if you're in a browser, you have to use JavaScript. And now you can also use Rust thanks to Wasm, but that's a completely different story. Um, and 
the pretty colors thing is there's not really, you know, as far as what's the difference between JavaScript and Python, JavaScript can work with multiple core CPUs better than Python can. And it can work with events better than Python can. So Python is really bottom of the barrel in terms of modern languages. It's very nice to learn, but it's not well suited at all for the modern world because the two, the two inventions that came about that have changed, that have actually required different programming languages to, to exist have been the internet and, and multi-core CPU computers. If it weren't for those two things, there wouldn't be any difference between JavaScript and Python other than the color. You know, like you like one because you like it, you don't like the other because you don't like it. It wouldn't make any difference. Python does not have good support for event-based programming or taking advantage of multiple CPUs. Uh, the languages that are new that do this are Go and Rust and JavaScript kind of sorta, of. it's like halfway. It, it gets half marks. Um, Languages that are really, really bad for this sort of stuff are languages like C and C++ and um, Python, Ruby, um, Java and C Sharp are kind of in the middle ground. They've been updated to the point where they can work just about as well as JavaScript. So let's let's create a middle of the road. So JavaScript, Java, and C Sharp are all kind of middle of the road. They've been updated well enough that you can reasonably get work done on a modern computer with these languages. Um, and then I think I'd put Zig here as well, but that one's really obscure. Nobody knows about it yet. Rust, Go, JavaScript, all pretty mainstream. Um, Java and C Sharp are legacy, but still useful. And then there are... Uh, SQL? No. So that's not a programming language. Oh, uh, okay. So pro S SQL is a... It's a... It's not a programming language because you, you can't... Well, you can add 1 plus 1 in, in SQL. Um, and... In specific dialects of SQL, like if you were to talk about Transact SQL, which is Microsoft's version of SQL, or if you were to talk about PSQL, which is the Postgres version of SQL, they do allow for functions and stuff, and you can program in them, but it's really, really obnoxious. It's it's really bad. Um, so you would not really want it, to... It's That's a domain-specific language. It's not a programming language. HTML, CSS, SQL, none of those are programming languages. So, not programming. HTML, CSS, SQL, and there's probably a number of other languages we could put in there. Markdown. Um, these are languages that, that help describe some stuff, but they don't you couldn't write, you can't write a program in them. Okay, so that's kind of some background. So what, what other questions do you have? Out of all the good programming languages, which one would you pick for beginners to 100% Go. Go is the best language to learn. Not only is it a great language to learn, well, and JavaScript, but JavaScript is, it's hard to find good learning material for JavaScript, in my opinion, because most of the learning material out there is really bad and getting worse. Um, Go is designed by people who think very simply and who want things that are easy. The people that are in the JavaScript community are people who do not think simply and want things that are extravagant and that are cool. So JavaScript is being driven by coolness. 
But it, as a language, it has a lot of features, and you have to learn it. You do have to learn JavaScript. You don't have an option. There is no, like, well, will I learn JavaScript or will I not learn it? You will learn it, or you're not going to be a programmer. I don't think that there's any possible way that you could avoid it because it is the most widely deployed progr programming language in all of history, um, and there is nothing set to replace it at this point. But Go is incredibly easy to learn uh, and very, it's, you rub shoulders with really smart people and you can get good jobs with Go. Rust is very difficult to learn. Zig is a little bit easier to learn, but not as easy as Go. And it's also very young. It hasn't even been around for 10 years yet. Okay. And, um, it, and there's, there's, you have to be a little bit more careful using it. You would never, well, not never, but um, there's no use in learning a language like C or C++ unless you have to. These languages are very dangerous. They basically lead to computers getting viruses and crashing, and every single time I think that there's C++ code on an airplane, it makes me afraid for my life, and I don't know how they land. And in some cases, they don't. I mean, there have been bugs that have been related to stupid, stupid problems that would... Ne it's Languages like Go, Rust, and JavaScript, there are certain problems that it is not possible to have. C and C++, every possible problem that could happen, it is possible to create in C and, and the compiler, meaning the code will run. We don't want code to run if the code is definitely wrong. If, if, if you could look at the code and logically understand beyond a shadow of a doubt there's no way this could run correctly, you don't want the, the, the program to even run the first line. You want it to just error out and say, hey, I can tell already there's no possible way for this thing to run correctly. Or, or rather, there is a possible way for it to definitely run incorrectly, either of those conditions. Um, you kind of just want the program not to run at all. So Go is is really the best in terms of um, easy to learn, extremely valuable, lots of really smart people to learn from, and very just very simple. Okay. Um, so you've been talking about learning multiple languages. Um, would you learn them separately or you would kind of learn them together? Let's say one hour each. So what would be your advice on this? Uh, it's hard to say because I don't have enough experience in, in people trying out this approach and getting feedback on it. But what I would say is you want to do the same thing in two different languages according to the way that language does it. So, for example, in Go, you don't really... You don't do loops the same way in Go. In Go, you use range. Whereas in JavaScript, you would use for each. And in Python you would use four. So the loops, if you try to copy the Python for loop into JavaScript, you can, but it's gonna be a little bit weird because you're doing it the Python way in JavaScript and likewise in Go, you could copy, you could directly copy a Python loop into Go, but then it wouldn't be exactly what, it wouldn't be Go-like. So the purpose of learning multiple languages is to learn the idioms of the language so that you can be a better, you can have a better understanding of what it means. Because if I show you two different things that accomplish the same result, you have two ways of looking at it. And so I, I'd, I'd put it like this, cylinder, square, uh, circle. This is the like the best thing I know to, to illustrate this if the right graphic comes up. Yeah, here we go, this thing right here. 
See that? Okay, yeah. So, the, like, this is kind of the difference between a programming language. In Go, it's going to look like a square. In Python, it's going to look like a circle. In reality, the loop is a loop is a loop is a loop. All loops are the same. But if you view them from a different angle, you you do it in a slightly different way. It still accomplishes the same goal. It's the same thing. But you look at it differently. But the, the, the beauty of looking at it differently is if you only ever did a loop in Go, then you'd think that loops are squares. And if you only ever did a loop in Python, then you'd think that loops are circles. But if you do a loop in two or three different languages, then it'll really you know, make it concrete in your mind. Like, ah, oh, this is exactly what a loop is. I get it because I've seen it here and I've seen it here and it's the same thing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So that's, that's the purpose of say, you know, learning multiple languages. Uh, it's not, it, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's not because you need to know a lot of languages. You don't. You should know very few languages. But learning multiple languages is at a beginner level for that language um, will help you understand programming better and it will give you good ideas. Because, for example, in JavaScript, there are not very many people out there that teach how to do JavaScript simple. But you can look at Go and you can look at Python. Both of those are very simple languages, which is why I love them so much. Um, and you can take what you learn in those languages and you can apply it to JavaScript. And you can write simpler JavaScript. You don't have to write JavaScript in a complicated way. Likewise, if you were to look at Java um, and then go to JavaScript and try to write Java like JavaScript, these languages have nothing in common. The reason that they... Java is to JavaScript as car is to carpet. They both start with the same four letters. And that's it. Um, but if you were to, to try to approach uh, writing JavaScript like Java, you'd see a lot more like the way that maybe most people try to write JavaScript. It's very complicated. There's lots of classes and prototypes and it's, um, you know, but... It, but you don't have to write it that way. And likewise, I learn a little bit of Rust, and I'm not good at Rust, um, but I, I can get by to write some programs, but I don't spend a lot of time in it. But Rust has a thing called enums that is really, really nice way of, of handling a limited set of possibilities. So kind of like if else, if else, if else, if else. Like if you could, if you could guarantee that every possible else was handled, that is kind of like what an enum is in Rust, but it's very simple. And Go doesn't have that, but because I learned a little bit of Rust, I can write better Go because I can say, what have I learned about enums from Rust, and how can I apply that to Go? And so I write simpler Go code than I would have otherwise. And this, this is the, the reason I say to, to learn multiple languages, so that you are exposed to different ways of doing things. Okay. That sounds great. Okay, AJ. Well, I personally believe it's been very, very beneficial to see all this. Um, that they have things in common, as well as um, your you 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 did have a breakdown of the languages um, and which ones would be better to kind of learn. Yeah, thank you, thank you for today. Yeah. Um, there's one other thing that I kind of want to go over. Do you still have a couple minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because the very first thing that you asked, which is kind of where I thought this was going to go in the beginning, um, was the anatomy of a program as it's, uh, you know, as itself. And I, and I would say this, most programs start with dependencies also they're called imports sometimes so you might see for example um, no, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head 
display. Let's say display. And different languages will do it differently. Python does it something like this. It does uh, import display from uh, display dot star or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they do it different ways. But typically at the top of a program, you have your dependencies. And then you have your uh, state, your what, what we might call the program state, or which might be, for example, this is a really bad example, but uh, let's say a counter. Um, let's do one better. Let's let's say instead it is. Uh, let's say we have a magic number, pi. Pi is equal to three point one four. We'll say. Um, and then you typically have your main. And then in most languages, main runs itself. In JavaScript, you would have to call it. Otherwise, nothing happens. But I would say that this is a basic anatomy of a program, is it has dependencies, saying what things are going to be used in this program. It has some initial state that you set up to define certain things that are most likely not going to change or perhaps need to be shared, but with caution on that one, um, between different parts of the program. And then uh, you have a, a main function, and then maybe you have a bunch of other functions or... Um, Good old goose do stuff, one of our favorite functions. And then if you are JavaScript, you have to call main. I think that Python is also this way, actually. I don't remember exactly what the syntax is for it, but you have to you do something like this, underscore, underscore main yeah. dot run it or was, something something like that. It was something similar, yeah, to yeah. Yeah, so in Python, it depends, because if you start out the program, depending on how you start the program, sometimes the Python program will just start running on its own, and sometimes you have to call main, and I don't remember what it is. And JavaScript is the same way. I, did, I recommend that you just put the stuff you need to do in a main function and then call it at the end, because otherwise you can end up with a lot of junk in the middle of the program. And then with these dependencies, quite often the dependencies are two other parts of the program itself. So let's say I have a counter and I might require lib counter and you've seen something like this in, in Python where when I don't give it a directory name, it's something that I've installed as a dependency. And when I do give it a directory name, it goes and looks in that directory for that part of the program to load. And so I'd say that this, this is a fairly um, common anatomy. Go programs look like this. JavaScript programs look like this. Ruby programs look like this. Python programs look like this. Even to some extent, C programs look like this. But that's... I believe Python is a bit easier to read than JavaScript, isn't it? Uh, it depends. The, the problem with Python in reading it is that you only have spaces to work with. And so uh, you can lose track of where something ends. Mm, but okay. yeah, I prefer, like I find it a lot easier to read things when there's brackets. And it's also easier to get around the code when there's brackets because almost every editor does folding and I, I guess they do it for Python as well, but it, it just makes a lot more sense than other languages to say, like, if I'm here, just take me to the end of the function. Um, AJ, just um, one more question. Yeah. Um, while it's still in my mind. So when you, uh, so talking about variables, you, you have typed in, uh, typed in over that variable. Does it really matter in which kind of order does it go? Um, if you could return back to where you've been. Um, Wait, I which one? Up here? Up here or down below? Down below? Uh, down below. 
Oh, oh. Here we go. Um, ah. So we have variable display. Yeah. Um, is it gonna interact with um, where you type in functions main? Let me. Go. So different languages do this differently. Um, okay. The best way to go about it is to typically you list your dependencies alphabetically and two ways you do it alphabetically and by dependency system so we have what would be the built-ins so for example um, okay. let me let me try this Typically, first you do your built-ins, which are things that are just part of the programming framework itself. So one that I use all the time in Node would be URL. So let's say this is, uh, that's a built-in. And then I might have the, um, I don't know what to call this actually. The local, the locals, and then the third party. So this is just a convention that a lot of people use and that works really well. And so within each one of these, you might choose to list them alphabetically just for fun. Uh, but you kind of have like, these are the things that are prepackaged into the programming language or the framework. These are the things that you've created for yourself and then these are the things that you downloaded through a package manager like a pip install or a python egg or something like that or an npm install and then in in some languages like go if you were to do something like this say um i i'm, I'm gonna botch this but uh let's see three What's, what's not radius? Diameter? There we go. So if you were to do something like this in Go, it actually will rewrite the program and build the variables according to their dependency. So even though I declare this here, it will actually put it here. Okay. Um, because obviously, if pi doesn't exist yet and I'm multiplying with pi, that's an error. So in JavaScript, this would give unpredictable results. In Python, I think it would give an error. And in Go, I think it works. I know it works between files. I think it works within the same file because Go will just look at where everything is and then put them in the right order. And typically speaking, all of your functions that are declared and this I think this is not true in Python I think in Python you actually have to declare functions in order but in most languages if I declare the function do stuff down here I can still run the function do stuff up here okay. yeah. um, in some languages you actually have to put declare things up above they have to exist before uh, they're declared but but generally especially modern languages that's not true because functions are just events you know, like we were talking about with the the machine there's a function that handles when the cache gets inserted and the function doesn't do anything until that event happens so binding the action man asks what language are we working in and we're not really working in a language right now we're just discussing programming language concepts um, in general and so this looks like JavaScript and it is mostly JavaScript but I'm just using it as a representation of programming yeah well at least I understood something today <laughs> which is great good well uh, tell me more what did you understand give me a recap what did you learn today well what I did learn um, was that 
most of the languages have something in common. Um, they have almost everything in common. Yeah. Um, then um, you gave examples of <coughs> of Go, of Python, and um, JavaScript as well. Uh, so, yeah, probably the next one I'll pick myself will be Go, and I even, I even then know whether whether I should return back to Python and complete the studies or I should jump on Go and try to see how it works out. I, you know, I, I think that it's good to finish a course, right? So learn, continue to learn Python, but see if you can figure out how, how to do the same thing in Go, right? So do something in Python, then try to do the same thing in Go. And Go has such excellent, excellent, excellent resources available. So there's Go by Example. I think it's gobyexample.com. Uh, there is, let's see, the, the, um, gosh, well, I forget what it's called. Is it called Practical Go? Um, I need, it's, I, patterns in Go, let me, it's on the Golang website. Um, if I can find it, I'll, get, I'll give you a couple of links here. There's Trigo, the playground. Uh, there is oh tour of go that's what it is tour of go I'll give I'll give you these links okay thank you um, what what is it golang documentation golang docs it's right right here tutorial tutorial how to write go tour of go effective go that's what it's called effective go let me just put this all together now some of the concepts in the tour of go assume that you've programmed before but whatever uh, just go through it um, if you get to a point where it's just not making any sense at all then stop uh, let's see I'm gonna send this to you over in discord and I'll put this in the YouTube uh, description as well these these links so effective go is a mini book I don't know how many pages it ends up being but it is it is a book and it talks about a lot of the paradigms of go um, a way is go used in Ev modern day, shall we say everything on the internet everything on the internet's built in go uh, well, okay. not all programs that exist that are internet programs exist in Go, but all aspects of networking and internet technology have been written in Go, and they are wildly popular. So as you learn more about programming, you'll hear about things like Docker and Kubernetes and, uh, and uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the major, one of the major proxies. One of them's Caddy, the other one is name escapes me for the minute but uh tons of infrastructure really core important stuff is written in go and go by example is absolutely amazing i'm going to put that right up there with it's probably even better than tour of go I mean, if you just went through this so check out the first example and then you just go through to the next one and the next one and the next one but use the, you can use the go playground and you can go through the examples. You could have the playground open in one tab, and the tour, of the the go by example open in another tab, and you could just try things out one by one by one. Excellent way to learn Go. And then I think there was one other resource that I was thinking of, maybe. Oh, and the way to install Go. This this is important. Web install dev slash go link. Uh, the the instructions that they give you on how to install it kind of assume that you're already very familiar with Linux and you know how to update your path and 
um, and you know the consequences of installing something as an administrator, so it's uh, unfortunate. But use webinstall.dev slash golang, and that will install it correctly for you exactly the way that um, you should expect it to work. It's, it's the right way to do it, for sure. Um, and I do recommend that you learn Vim. And so have you used Vim at all other than those couple of times that we did a session together? Um, I've, I've probably gone up to level four, I believe. Oh, in the Vim adventures? Yes. But, but have you actually used Vim to write any code yet? You know what? I haven't. I have to confess. Okay. So I'd also recommend Vim Essentials. So I'm going to put this in here too. And there's a lot of people using Vim um, to program, or not really. Oh no, Vim is one of the most popular editors. It is. It was probably the most popular editor before VS Code, and it has a lot of advantages. It, VS Code is difficult to get working on a server. Vim. Every computer in the universe has Vim installed. Uh, if you were to be able to log into an Apple Watch or a toaster, Vim would be there. Uh, that's a little slight exaggeration, but not by much. Every Mac has Vim. Every Linux computer has Vim. Every server has Vim. Vim is kind of the universal editor. And it's pretty good, too. It's not just that it's universal. It's also quite good. Um, okay. So the one thing that you got to be aware of is that it is mode-based. So you have to hit escape, colon, WQ to get out of it, to save your work. Uh, but yeah, these all of this stuff will get installed with very reasonable defaults. Basically, one of the problems with Vim is that a lot of the people in the community are very extremely technical and they're not really good at talking at the beginner level. And so I packaged all the things that you would be likely to want to use together so that you can just run this one command on your Mac and you get everything that most people have in Vim without having to learn any special configuration or anything. It'll just, it'll all just be working and you won't even know until you go use a Vim that doesn't have it. But if you are ever on an, on a server or something that doesn't have these installed, again, you just copy and paste this and then boom, you know, 10 seconds later, you have the same setup at someone else's computer that you have at your own computer. Um, so yeah, that's really good. So anyway, I've got all of that stuff. Now I've sent it to you in the chat. I am clicking the button. Um, and Oh, sorry, I just saw another comment came in. Uh, do you agree the only way to truly become proficient in any language is project-based utilization? I, I don't know what the alternative is. So the only reason I wouldn't say yes is because I don't know what is in opposition. Like, give me the opposite approach of that. Um, you certainly can't learn a language by reading books. You have to try out the examples. Now, there's plenty of books that have good examples in them, like little mini projects, like the Rust book, uh, and, and the Golang book is actually pretty good. I forget what... The Rust has the Rust book. Uh, Python, the hard way, has lots of examples in it. Um, and then the... I forget what the title of the Golang book is called, but I think it's the most popular one. It has good programs in it. Uh, so you could start out that way, but I'd, I'd recommend, and I'm going to I'm gonna pop this into the, the links I just mentioned into the description, and I, I guess I'll try to put those also in the comments. Um, but I would recommend, uh, I'll put this, let's see, I'll put this here. I've got a great list, and Caspers, this is something that... I'd suggest you take a look at too, because you will at some point want to have, uh, you know, some sort of project. I have a list of projects that I think are really great portfolio projects to do, and so I'm going to give this link to everybody. Um, oh, whoops! It's not going to let me do that that way. 
Let me try this. Hold on. Um, whoops. And this one, and this one. And I'm sending this to you in Discord, and I'm adding it to the links for the description. There we go. So now all that's saved in the description links and stuff. Sorry. Hey, thank you. Why well, I got I got uh, sidetracked there. What was the last thing that you'd said? Did you did I did I answer it or whatever? Yeah, I believe you had answered. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much for today's session. It was very very useful. I believe not to not just only to myself so this is well that I was watching. Yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see how many of them weren't bots. <laughs> Cuz oftentimes when people come in and just thumbs up and go it, and they all get removed tomorrow, but I we at least had a couple of people commenting, so yeah, hopefully for these couple of people and if anybody watches in the future, I hope I hope it's valuable. Yeah. All yeah. right. Um, it was valuable to me. Thanks, Asia. Good. I'm, well, that's the most important thing because that's what we're doing this for. Okay. Well, you look up to yourself. All right. Will do. I, I shall see you later. All right. You do the same. See ya. All right. Bye. Adios. And to everybody watching, like it if you liked it. Uh, subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications if you want more like this. Particularly, do the personalized notifications so you get the code stuff. And... If you've got any questions, comments, whatever, leave them down in the comments. I will check them out if you comment and get back to you with my thoughts. And with all of that out of the way, it is time for me to, yeah, I already said adios, but I'll say it again. Adios.